So welcome to our symposium and the last symposium for the Holistic Education Seek for this 2021 ARA. And we are delighted to be here today. We've got a big international crew with you for this symposium called Self-Care Strategies in Academia, Perspectives from the Field. So my name's Narelle Lemon. I'm from Swinburne University of Technology in Melbourne, Australia, and I'm delighted to be here with my colleagues, Marnie Binder from Ryerson University in Toronto, Canada, Catherine Heuser from University of St. Joseph's in America, Michelle Tishy from Rowlands University, also in America, and our lovely discussant, Joanna Higgins from Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand. So we've got Australia, Canada, USA, and New Zealand represented in this international symposium. So just before um, we move forward, I'd just like to acknowledge that I'm beaming in today from Melbourne and I want to acknowledge um, on behalf of those present the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet. I pay respect to their elders, past, present and emerging. I also pay respect to my Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people of Australia and hope that their path towards reconciliation continues to be shared and embrace. Before we move forward into our symposium, I'm just going to invite us to take a mindful minute just to become present and totally absorbed in this time together. So I invite you to um, be comfortable in your chair, whether or you may want to stand up, either close your eyes or lower your gaze. And just inhale nice and deeply into the gut and exhale and just be with your breath. Bring your mind to this present moment. When you're ready, join us back. So welcome to our symposium. And we have a lovely program established for you. Um, it's early morning here, evening, afternoon for most of you as well. And um, our order of today will be hearing from Marnie, then Catherine, then Michelle, myself, and then Joanna as discussant. We'll leave Q and A, question and answer, until the end. But of course, you're more than welcome to use the chat box throughout the session. And after we hear from Joanna, because we're going to be a relatively small group, I think there's 12 with us so far, we're very much opening up that possibility um, for you just to share using the microphone for discussion. Um, so enjoy this session that we've put together for you. Before we move forward, I just want to let you know that um, we are talking a lot about self-care today. We are coming from a position where we think about self-care as being a proactive action with elements, strategies, practice, support that you do to support yourself, protect and also maintain your well-being as well. And we really think about self-care from a position of self-love self-compassion, self-awareness and self-regulation. And we think about those elements and how they enhance us and support us as much as they support others. So our framework, as you'll see um, throughout each of the presentations today, connects with different elements of the I, the we and the us. And we really think about self-care as we think about ourselves and we have self-compassion for ourselves. But in doing that, we also have compassion for our fellow colleagues in academia and in life really and in how we by supporting ourselves we are supporting others as well 
We acknowledge that the system is broken, so we certainly don't come from a position of finger pointing saying it's an individual's perspective, it is solely our perspective. We think about relationally in terms of the whole concept, but we also think about self-care as being empowered. And there are certain aspects that we can do that empower us individually and also those that we work with and then the filtering out for the us collective in academia. We really want to shift those conversations about self-care and well-being with what we do from behind those closed doors as well and opening up those dialogues. And this symposium is a beautiful example of being able to do that and inviting a collective voice as well. We think self-care is worthy of our attention and that through line will very much come through our presentations today, individually and collectively. So we're asking some questions today about what do you do for self-care? And we'll answer these questions ourselves as well. And how do you position well-being as a part of the role of what you do in academia? So through image and word, we have created various visual narratives and we highlight as a reality for us individually. And then we share our voice and the voice of our colleagues as well to reposition or position self-care as worthy of our attention. Our presentations today all come from a book series with Rutledge, which I'm delighted to say that book one and two's covers, fresh off the press mock-ups, came about four hours ago for us, which is very, very exciting. And each presenter today, discussant, is involved in this book series as well. So book one and book two are um, manuscripts are almost to proof stage, which is really exciting with the intention of these two books, creating a place for self-care and well-being in higher education, finding meaning across academia. And the second book, Healthy Relationships in Higher Education, Promoting Wellbeing Across Academia, due out this year. And we have two further books um, that will be out um, the following year, um, with the intention of about 12 books coming out in the next four years. So it's all action-packed. Um, I'm editing a couple of the books to get going, but there's some amazing other authors and editors involved in the series as well. And there's space also to um, be a part of it as well or pitch. Um, so if you're interested, you've got a burning passion, want to be involved, check it out on the website. I'll post that link in the comment box for you so you can um, engage with it. So welcome to our symposium. I'm going to stop sharing and I will now open it up to Marnie to be our okay. first presenter. Let me get my, oh, let's see if I can, can you see my screen yet or not? No. Not quite okay. yet. Okay, hang on a second. I have to get out of what I had first when I was sharing and just get out of here and do this and then I'll be fine. Okay. Sorry about this, people. I've just lost my, there we go. Okay, fingers crossed this works. Yes, it does. Okay, so welcome everybody. Um, while I get this started, my name is Marnie Binder. As you heard from Narelle, my pronouns are she, her. I'm an associate professor and associate director of academic leadership at Ryerson University in Toronto. I am presenting from Ticoronto in the Dish with One Spoon territory. The Dish with One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples and Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. It is such an honor to be here. Um, with these wonderful colleagues today and very excited to see the first two covers of the books. That's really cool. So when I conceived of this presentation, uh, Toronto was just coming out of what was to be a number of many lockdowns. And so now over a year later, while my content has not changed, I think my context has shape-shifted. Oops, sorry. So it's been, oops, I'm so sorry. Let me try this one again, yes. It has been a year like no other. And when we shut down on March 16th, 2020, Toronto resembled a street with no name. Early meandering was haunting at times, but the silence and extended silence became almost comforting as the city retreated. And then it was three months later. 
and there was some relief and some signs of city life, but that confined feeling remained. And now over a year later, the days remain the same, blurring the lines of lives once lived. The events and freedoms remain removed and untouchable and social justice issues have risen to the surface. And I write, inequity is exposed. George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, say their names. BLM, BIPOC, grief, trauma, centuries deep, societies fragmented, how to heal. I wonder if we have become comfortably numb behind our masks. Can we find our hearts? Gratitude for the small things that surround become the inside the fragile skin of life. So last March, we scrambled to put the last few weeks of our courses into a virtual environment, a challenge for many. And so the winter term 2020 was finished at home and it continued. And as so many of you know and experienced, the summer of 2020 was spent inside Zoom spaces, Zooming to recreate our face-to-face -face courses into an emergency virtual reality for the fall. That now extended into the winter of 2021. And now as we have sort of entered a third lockdown in Toronto, the unknown becomes fragmented and a very fatigued reality for many. I also stepped into a new leadership role in August of 20, um, in August uh, 27th, to be exact, as we journeyed into new territory. And it was one where I questioned how collaboration and collegiality, well-being and self-care could unfold for faculty, instructors and students. So I reflect on this surreal time since last March, and I will share with you snippets and interludes of this journey and the importance of collaboration and learning and teaching and how I bring generosity and kindness to my academic community, emerging from the liminal spaces that I dwelled in. And I write a poem entitled, The First Lockdown, Stuck. I thought my creativity would expand, opportunities to creatively document images, collages, a bricolage of newspaper words, crafted, stuck, stuck, stuck. I lost motivation, incentive vanished, with the freedoms I was grateful for, stuck, stuck, stuck. My inner critic still yells out to me as I move through the cobwebs of inertia in this surreal world. It has been over a year, slow and slowly unsticking, dwelling in the feelings of being creatively stuck. And I discover I have always been awake, an opening appears. And I write, a year like no other. In this lifetime, the dark embraces, traces the lines, the textures of our places in the cosmos. I am grateful for witnessing. I shed my grief for the sadness of others. I have feared, I have let go of anger. I desire changes of the heart. I sense clarity as pain releases. To set intentions, to write, to create, Breathe, expand, waiting to be. Barbara Bickel in her new book called Art, Ritual and Trance Inquiry, A Rational Learning in an A Rational World, views, quote, art, ritual and trance as the spaces of the in-between, the liminal realms where traces of the numinous can be encountered. She speaks of the numinous as a non-place, mysteries about learning, to inquire, unlearn, frightening, our human curiosities found in Bickle 2021. There have been moments where I have felt as if I have not left this liminal space, but remained in the in-between. But it is here in the numinous where I have found the openings for generosity and kindness in my personal and professional life. It is here in the numinous that I have discovered even more the power of collaboration. The well-being and mindfulness initiatives are a focus across many campuses in Canada and globally. And it is felt that the current soup du jour does not really address what self-care means for faculty and students in higher ed. Initiatives are individualized rather than holding space for relational restorative interconnections. And I draw on Bergen Sieber, 
Jordan, Richardson, Fisher, Bickle, and Walsh for those ideas. Webster and Wright, 2013, advocated for academics, quote, to practice reflective thinking. By Morgan, Stewart, and Cohn argued for the importance of holism in education, quote, the state of being whole, where, quote, holistic paradigms of education are for healing. These mind practices of mindful awareness are not prevalent in the academy. And while I value the numerous initiatives and supports my university offers and has offered through well-being initiatives for both students, faculty, and staff, I question if they truly look at detoxifying the academic environment. My inner critic surrenders to becoming and being as I reflect and recognize while stuck in moments of lethargy and unknowing. My mind and spirit has been meandering and finding the path to return through the rituals that have taken root over time. These personal self-care responses have allowed me to support others and bring it to their teaching and learning. I recognize that I need to support and create balance in my life. Um, <coughs> sorry, to support others. And I need to be aware and awake to the energy of support and care for others that can fragment my self-care and my energy for self-care. And while I model and encourage, I notice I have sidestepped my own breath, holding space for myself. And I write, my rituals, often sporadic, divergent at times, but emerge when needed. Some inform my day. The tactile of arranging my stones each morning connect me to the earth. The stones are a metaphor for grounding the mind, body, and spirit. The stones in these moments calm the monkey mind I often awaken with. Offerings of gratitude to all beings, the earth, and sending healing energy and love back out to those in need honor reciprocity. My yoga classes, my practice of once to twice a week, brings me to my attention and my intentions. Short moments of meditation, sometimes when I walk, I go with the flow of what speaks to me at any given time. And then there are times where I just pause. My partner reminds me of this regularly. Aesthetic joy and living aesthetically is important in self-care. What brings you aesthetic joy? Is it walking in nature? Is it surrounding yourself with art, poetry, or moments of pleasure and beauty? Living aesthetically in the world is of importance, not just during these challenging times, but always. One way for me is the weekly ritual of having flowers in our home, and it represents so much more as I watch the changes in growth, representation, and presentation each flower offers me and us, a metaphor for life. I am reminded by my dear late colleague, the poet and scholar, Carl Lego, who always reminded us to live poetically in the world. And for me, it was about living aesthetically in the world too. And as I read these words, I'm reminded that this is what I bring to my learning and teaching. This is what I bring to my well-being support of faculty, staff, and students. And these moments I share with students and colleagues. Every clash starts with breath work, sometimes a short body scan. I share sites and resources for individual practice. I have brought well-being sessions to our school through student engagement initiatives and invited all of our community students, staff, faculty, and instructors. I connect with like-minded colleagues across schools and faculties. All this informs how I move in with and through this world with heart and spirit. Erin Morgenstern in her book, The Starless Sea wrote, quote, once there was a woman who sculpted stories. So how do I sculpt this new story once we return to campus? Continue to sculpt my leadership role what opportunities present themselves through collaborative engagements with others? How do I place well-being at the center of what I, we do? How do I dwell in the liminal spaces of social justice issues, unpack white privilege and help others and to and bring this mindfully to learning and teaching to support colleagues and students? How do I bring generosity, mindfulness and kindness to all of this? There is an opportunity to change the academic narrative once we return to campus. There are many faces of academia and centering the importance of well-being, pushing back on traditional models of the individualism is crucial for the new journey we will be embarking on. Do we want to return to previous models of academic design that fragment, hold silos intact, play lip service to well-being and to learning and teaching as equally being as important as research? 
Though there's acknowledgement of the scholarship of teaching and learning and its research, standardized forms of research are the dominant discourse. Collaboration as a model for teaching and learning and research needs to be an active pedagogical focus. Well-being does not end with the pandemic and it started way before and research shows how important this is to our way of knowing and being in the world. I know there are more questions and answers here, but this is how action, this is how the how becomes action. And so I challenge with questions and small steps. My past collaborations with colleagues and students allow for emergence of new curiosities to create balance in one's personal professional life. I have the privilege to be a teaching chair, working with committed, those committed to the scholarship and pedagogy of teaching and learning. And now in my new leadership role, I bring these learnings as I co-create new ones with my colleagues, instructors, and the students I engage with. So my learnings from liminal dwellings, belonging and safety, collegiality, rediscovery, peer support, synchronicity, mindfulness, holistic, care of students, self-care practices, creative practices, mentorship through wisdom and experience, discomfort, awareness, cultivating mindful slash selfless generosity that deepens our teaching, renewed energy, resilience through contemplative mindful presence, an open heart, a found poem in Binder, Martin and Schwinn, 2018. And Rhonda McGee reminds us at the end of her book, The Inner Work of Racial Justice, May we bring ourselves into continual conversation with one another and with racial injustices here and now, ending the suffering and making things right, one luminous reconnection at a time. So where do you situate yourself? Silo, solo, or collaboration? Giving, receiving, or both? Where do we situate ourselves in this new sculpted story? A found poem from Robin Kimmerer in Braiding Sweetgrass. Generosity, a moral, material imperative well-being of one, well-being of all, culture of gratitude, circle of reciprocity, give and receive, humility, honor our responsibilities for all we have been given, for all we have taken in return for the privilege of breath. And so in many ways, as I end where I begin, I've come to recognize that I dwell in the liminal spaces for a reason, the pause, the retreat from the everyday time and space. Through this visual narrative, creative moments reflect and embody a way of being in the world and being present. We connect to our bodies, breath, and personal cosmologies, where a confluence of balance and spirit empowers us to place the self within the higher community. A collegial, synergistic spirit is possible. It is what Green called white awakeness and Irwin called becoming, and I call this finding the spaces in between, the liminality of generosity within the academic world and I write in conclusion, relational intentions to live in a good way, move in a good way, be in a good way with generosity, reciprocity, relationship, gratitude, compassion, and love. Dare I say generosity, compassion, and love in the academy? I dwell in the liminal spaces, my consciousness with conscience, stepping in, out, shifting back and forth holding liminal space, holding space. Thank you. That was beautiful, Barney. Thank you so <laughs> much. <laughs> Uh, I, I had it earlier and now it's gone. Um, just a second. Here we go. Are, are you all seeing my screen? Not yet. Okay.
now. Perfect. Okay, great. I'm Catherine Heuser from the University of St. Joseph in Connecticut, USA. And I'm, I'm so happy to be here with Joanna and Narelle uh, and uh, Marnie and Michelle. It's just a great pleasure and honor to be working with, with all of you. It's been so easy and wonderful um, as an experience. So this is my positionality. I am a she, her for my pronouns. And as you can see, I come from a privileged situation. I am a full professor, so I don't have to worry about tenure anymore. I am Anglo-Saxon white, cisgender, middle class, although my parents grew up in poverty. I'm an agnostic at a small private Catholic university, but they haven't seemed to care about that. I'm a first generation university degree person, which has helped me relate to many of our students who are in that same situation. Today, I am asking you to consider stepping off the edge, as Michael Franklin calls it. I will give you the context of that later. But as we face more and more tasks that are administrative, more and more paperwork that has to be done in 24 hours for the administration, as the university um, switches in ways that create a conflict with our own moral values. And as, as uh, Daphne Lodes explained, the impoverishment of academic life is for many commentators a result of what has come to be called the neoliberal university. The, this is a shorthand for the accusation that the heart has been removed from higher education and replaced by the market, leaving no room for any other values or guiding principles. And I'm not going to spend my, my time dwelling on this aspect, but Lodes talks about the results of this. It's a crew materialism and narrow instrumentalism can lead to a profound sense of emptiness. Something important is missing. Spirit and heart are missing when faculty stress so much that they suffer from cognitive dissonance between the humanizing educational goals that inform their pedagogy and the soullessness of the university. Moreover, the education system has become one of teaching to the test rather than teaching the individual body, mind, and spirit. Indeed, students, as Lewis has said, have become brains on sticks. Not only faculty suffered then in this dissonance, but also students. If faculty are alienated from their institution, they will not be able to teach with their whole selves. I have found a way of coping with this dissonance using Parker Palmer's concept of the community of congruence. I have stepped out of my comfort zone and ended up discovering a beautiful community of congruence that has enhanced my life in many ways. As Parker Palmer has said, self-knowledge for faculty is crucial to good teaching, more so than knowing my students and my subject even. So creating that balance of community of congruence and the importance of wholeness and a holistic education is healing, not only for us as faculty, but for our students as well. As Miller has said, holism is literally a search for the whole in a culture that limits, suppresses, and denies wholeness. Teaching to the mind, body, and spirit, a healthy life, a balance and living divided no more can result in that from that wholeness of living and being. So what is this edge that I am talking about? Well, the art therapist director of the art therapy program at Naropa University, Michael Franklin, 
has pointed out the importance of art and creativity to self-care. And as I've highlighted in this quotation, he says that we get to a point where we really have to step off the edge of safety, plunge into the darkness of unknown spaces and take healthy risks. That is what I have done. A few years ago, feeling so alienated from my institution and myself, I realized change was crucial to preserve my well being. I stepped off the edge and ventured outside of my institution, outside of my school, of my discipline, to take a creative writing workshop at the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, Massachusetts. I had written a few poems as a, a, an English student, but I by no means consider myself a poet. Therefore, taking this workshop was a step into the unknown. I had no idea if the workshop would be a competitive format or if it would be collegial and supportive, inclusive. And it turned out to be inclusive, much to my uh, joy and benefit. So I ventured into this new situation and ended up with several wonderful outcomes that not only related to my academic publishing and presenting, but also my creative self, my poetry writing and the poetry workshops that I still take. So the impact of stepping off the edge is unknowable, but it was a safe edge to take. If this workshop had been competitive, I could have stopped going to it. I could have tried something different. I was just very fortunate. So in the first um, workshop, which is over here, I don't know if you can see my arrow pointing to the Fine Arts Work Center, but um, this is the group. Uh, here is our workshop leader, the great poet, Gal Gabrielle calvo Caressi. Uh, there I am right in front of her. And then to my left is uh, Maureen Hall, with whom I have gone on to write articles. And uh, Maureen introduced me to the artist and art educator, uh, Christy Oliver. We ended up in India at a conference. That's Maureen, that's Christy, that's myself, uh, with faculty and students at the university in Haridwar. Then eventually this wonderful project co-edited with Jane Dalton and Maureen and myself, the whole person by Roman and Littlefield uh, occurred after meeting Jane Dalton and presenting with her at the Association of Contemplative Mind in Higher Education. So all of this is from just that one step that I took and saying hello and doing an exercise with Maureen that has snowballed into something that I would never have predicted. And it wasn't my goal. My goal was to rejuvenate, rejuvenate myself um, poetically, creatively. And at the same time, then I can focus on that creative work and the academic work is also creative because I'm writing about my teaching and how I also uh, infuse um, meditation into my classes. It does help the students. I have presented and organized an entire um, faculty development day focusing on the, the usefulness of meditation and mindfulness in the classroom, as well as individually with colleagues at my university. So, so what was a step to heal myself has become something that has grown and been shared uh, throughout my university as well as throughout all of these uh, presentations and publications that we know um, has inspired other, other teachers to, to try our, our approaches. So 
stepping off the edge is a little scary, but so rewarding and so worth it. The visual narrative that I have of wholeness, again, there are stones. These are from the beaches uh, on Cape Cod. The way I read this pile is sometimes on the bottom is the community of congruence supporting me and my creativity and calmness as a result of that. And then myself at the top and other times it's reversed. So I could say that the largest stone is myself supporting my calmness, my creativity and my colleagues in this community. I have always collaborated with other people, which is not necessarily approved of by the Academy because they're so concerned with the, who is the first author and who should get credit. However, I find this collegial work as, as um, positive for myself, positive for the others involved in the group and productive. This creativity keeps growing and I see no end in sight. And I can talk about what Maureen and I did as our first project and then how that grew if, if people are interested later. So my challenge to you is what will you choose to step off the ledge to do? Will it be going to a teaching learning center on your campus and meeting colleagues from other disciplines and perhaps collaborating with them? Will it be taking a creative writing course, taking an art class, going to the local art league to, to try something if you don't want to go to the university? So if you're a terrible drawer, you don't have to worry about people on your university thinking anything about it. <laughs> um, I do stick figures. My students rather like them. So, um, so I, I challenge you to just sit for a moment and think about who you may have wanted to meet on your campus that you have not, that maybe you could talk to meet for a cup of coffee and start finding out if they share similar values with you. What ties my community of congruence together is that we're all focused on mindfulness and a holistic education, um, social emotional learning, generative literacy, developing empathy in our students and in ourselves to support them. So this is my conclusion with that challenge to think about what you would do to step off the edge and he, take care of yourself. Thank you very much. I think it is now my turn. <laughs> Get this into presentation mode though. <laughs> All right, my talk is called Finding My Center, Integrating Contemplative Practices, My Children and Higher Education into a Balanced Life. So first I'd like to do my land acknowledgement. On behalf of all in attendance here today, I pay respect to the traditional custodians of this land, the Timucua and Tukupago people, the larger nations of the Seminoles and the Muskokis. We pay thanks and respect to you. I pay respect to the past, current and future elders of the indigenous people of these lands of Central Florida. Who am I? I'm an academic brat. Um, ch a child of New York liberal intellectuals, um, Midwesternized by moving to Ann Arbor, Michigan when I was a little girl and growing up there. I call myself a Midwesternized New Yorker um, who is now in Florida. I'm the mother of two, my seven-year-old son and my 17-year-old daughter. Um, 
I'm a scholar activist who ended up in the gig economy um, after over a decade in a full-time professorship because I wasn't willing to stay in California in a full-time job when my mom was going through breast cancer. And I walked off a cliff to steal a little bit from Catherine's <laughs> metaphor um, and just trusted the universe and moved across the country to Florida in 2018. Um, so I've been hustling as a professor, as a mom, as a sandwich generation um, person a lot in the last couple of years, and the pandemic just accentuated this journey. Um, I call myself an earthy, crunchy academic mama, and I think I live that. Um, my presentation is really about these complex intersections of being a mother and an academic. I had my now 17-year-old daughter right after I finished my prelims in grad school at the University of Minnesota back in 2003. Um, I collected all my data while pregnant with her. I wrote my dissertation with a newborn literally on my breast. Um, so for me, my journey of becoming an academic is forever entwined with the act of becoming a mother. Um, so part of my journey from the beginning was mindfulness and finding those moments to just be. I'm going to start this part of my presentation both with a cute picture of my seven-year-old meditating and with a quote from Thich Nhat Hanh. Mindfulness shows us what is happening in our bodies, our emotions, our mind, and in the world. Through mindfulness, we avoid harming ourselves and others. This lesson, like this quote from Thich Nhat Hanh, is something that I had to learn really quickly because I I'm such a planner. When my daughter was born, I thought, oh, good, she's due in December, right at the end of the semester. Everything is going to go perfectly. I'll have my baby. I'll be back in, in the university setting eight weeks later, no problem. Without going into too much detail, we had a complicated delivery. Things were messy. They were not the way I planned them. And if I hadn't come back to my center through mindfulness, I don't know that I would have survived those first months because everything went out the window the minute I was holding my baby girl and recovering from a very unexpected C-section and just holding her to my chest and being in those initial moments is part of what helped me survive. This is a picture from that era. Um, so as a new mama trying to find my center after a very, very long birth process, in the early days needing to find my own inner wisdom and a path back to equilibrium. I'll be honest, I mean, things not going the way I had planned threw me into a bit of postpartum depression. I was freaked out. I wanted to be all of this as a mother and all of this as a PhD student who was ready to like write my dissertation and graduate and get a top-notch, amazing job doing what I loved. Um, but this precious little human being who I had just given birth to shifted my priorities that fast. Like there was no gray area, like she was my priority, body, mind, and soul. And I had to really, really, really go through a journey of rediscovery because how could I? Like I put all this effort into my doctoral program. I was ready to write my dissertation, but now this little human being, this little baby was way more important to me. I am blessed and I will acknowledge my doctoral advisor verbally at this moment, Dr. David W. Johnson, who's one of the gurus of cooperative learning in the world. He's a professor emeritus at the University of Minnesota now, told me the first time he saw Alexandria and I after she was born, Michelle, I would have been a midwife if I had been a woman. And I want you to embrace your new role and really lean into what that means. He's like, you've got seven years to finish your dissertation. I'm sure you can figure things out before seven years are up. And that one thing that he said the first time he saw me after I gave birth, 
gave me the permission I needed to lean into this journey and to be mindful and take a deep breath and keep moving forward. So now I will share some other cute pictures and um, really talk about something that was something that's very much my choice, but was something that really helped me in terms of aligning the complexity of this journey. Um, I started using breastfeeding as meditation when Alexandria was a baby. This picture is actually um, flashing forward many, many years to when Kieran was a toddler and I was even breastfeeding him on the ski slope because um, he was tired and needed a nap. And we took a mindful moment um, to be in that moment completely and totally and just connect um, and the fact that for me, becoming a nursing mother helped me to get through the complexities of the journey um, is really important to me. Um, this doesn't work for everyone, obviously, but for me, the act of nursing my babies was something that brought me back to my body. It brought me back to the moment and it helped me persevere through even the most challenging things that life and the academy threw at me um, when they were young. Um, so I want to share now um, kind of a broader narrative of what I, I wrote about and what I want to lean into, which is love, connection, and calm, um, and really that idea of pure present moment awareness. Um, this image embodies the purest and simplest form of embracing um, being fully human, fully in the moment, and being love. Um, and for me, part of the way that I've been able to weave this complex and vibrant and colorful life that I live is to really lean into the essence of love and connection and being in those beautiful moments. That doesn't mean that every moment was not like, you know, perfect. Like this moment was a perfect moment. It really embodies that deeper love and connection energy. And these moments are what allowed me to thrive, even when the demands of the job, the day job I had, or the demands of weaving together so many complex variables as a mother in the academy, those were messy. They were not neat and tidy, but these moments when I had my babies, I mean, this is a picture of Kieran when he was a newborn. In that moment, the rest of the world didn't matter. And so as long as I could have those moments, and isn't that the magic of mindfulness? Isn't that the magic of meditation? Is those moments don't have to be every moment because we, you know, none of us who are in this session are likely like sitting on the side of a mountain meditating for our entire lives. But these moments we can find in simple things. We can find in the being of who we are um, and being able to lean into the purity of love, the essence of just being who we are as human beings. So another way that I, I brought that about beyond just those moments are, you know, bringing joy and connection into every day of my journey as an academic. Um, I did baby wearing, toddler wearing. I kept my children with me as much as possible. Um, baby wearing was certainly another part of how I was able to balance being an early career scholar and a mother. Um, keeping them close allowed me to quote unquote juggle things more easily. Um, whether the universities I worked at loved it or not, when I needed to, I, I've taught with both of my children on my, you know, in a carrier. Um, when Alex was little, I did get back to um, being a TA. I even developed a class that I taught to first generation college students when Alex was a toddler. Um, and more often than not, I brought her with me and my students were better for it. Um, 
several of them actually still stay in touch with us um, because there weren't a lot of spaces for them. These first generation college students I was working with when Alexandria was little, where they saw their professors as human or the people who they were, in, were instructing them as human. They didn't find a lot of spaces where they could just be with other people who were living messy, beautiful lives. And so a lot of the students I worked with at the end of my doctoral program came to me just to spend time with people who weren't as formal, maybe people who were willing to let them be their messy selves. Um, but I was still in a position of authority. So that's another way that I've kind of juggled things is by being that safe place, that safe space for a lot of my students who being in higher education was a for formal, you know, a little bit of a juxtaposition from their lived lives. Um, Mommy and us, this is a fun picture. Um, being able to take breaks from the higher education intensity to just have fun and play with my children is one of the things that I've always done to create resilience. Um, I have to give credit to AERA. I mean, Alex has come with me to almost every AERA since I was pregnant with her. And being able to make AERA a time to have a family trip, to have an adventure, is another way that I've been able to find that, that joy in a journey that is often overwhelming and complicated and messy. Um, and it's, you know, fun is sometimes way overlooked in terms of, um, you know, being able to carve those spaces out of our lives to just be in joy. Um, and having these two with me has always made that easier. Um, so I'll leave that slide at that. Um, yeah, I mean, following up on that, finding time to be silly and laugh. Our journey is not always simple or easy, but we make a point of finding time for fun and laughter every day if possible. Um, and this slide is taken during the pandemic. I want to say like, I decided after never dyeing my hair a crazy color during my adolescence or young adulthood, that I was going to go pandemic purple. And this picture shows that well, even better than my hair is now. That's kind of those silly things, finding those um, things outside of the normal frame. Um, right now, I work part time as an adjunct for two universities and juggle other crazy academic roles. Because um, as I said at the beginning of the presentation, I'm, I'm an academic in the gig economy right now. And so nobody could tell me not to dye my hair purple. So I did it. And that's and kind of taking these breaks from being inside. I'm in Florida, so I can go outside anytime um, is another way of kind of weaving self-care and mindfulness and present moment awareness and my children into this complex, messy, joyful journey I have as an academic mother. Um, so. Even now, 17 years after becoming a mother, the most important thing for my well being is finding time to connect and cuddle with my children. And um, I'm really grateful. I'm grateful to both of my children and to, to my journey as a mother because I think these are the things that I've leaned into during the pandemic. Um, I cried for three days when AERA was canceled last year in February, and it's my children and them being like, mommy, it's okay. Everything's going to be like, they were reflecting back to me, the messages that I always give them. Um, because I knew in the end of February last year, when they canceled AERA, that we were not entering normal times like things were about to go upside down and my children are what helped me get through that um and the fact that we have the type of um love and connection that i can lean into at the moments that i am most terrified 
that that means the world to me and it's allowed me to actually thrive during this pandemic like my daughter and my son and i have done things i never thought were possible during the past year of our lives and i i'm just grateful for the opportunity to be their their mother and the fact that it's allowed me to do some pretty cool things academically this year as well so I will leave you all with just the invitation to um, lean into your own life um, and to find those magical moments of love and connection and care um, because you don't need a fancy protocol to take care of yourself and to love the people in your life and yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle, Marnie, and Catherine for an amazing presentation. Thank you. I'm tingling. It's, it's just absolutely gorgeous to hear, hear you speak. So I'm delighted to um, present the fourth paper. And I'm, I'm talking to you today about a personal tea ceremony, which is a mindful practice for me um, to navigate academia. And I create, curate this on Instagram. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the symposium, I think about self-care as a proactive action about taking care of yourself. And it involves steps to develop, protect, maintain and improve well-being. And I think about self-care as a repertoire of practices or a menu of practices across a whole different um, dynamic areas of well-being that we know that support us. And this is very much informed by a positive psychology for me. And it's about little small acts. And so I'm going to share with you a little small act today that I do that has an incredible, incredible impact for me and my self-care. And hopefully by curating it on Instagram, it poses, plants a little seed for others also to be empowered by little acts that can also be um, embraced and repeated over time that become a ritual that also become a habit that then enhance support empower and most of all become an embodied part of self-care self-care i think about as being a part of self-discovery. And so it's very much developmental, it's changing, it's growing just as we are as well. And it's also about not being perfect or comparing yourself to others, which is a big thing because I think in academia, um, we come from an environment that is incredibly competitive. And often what comes with that is about being perfect, being number one, getting that grant, being the first author on a publication, um, publishing the most and it just keeps on going the best scores the best this the best that it's the best the best the best the best perfect 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 and that's just not possible to do and it comes with an enormous amount of pressure that um, is just not sustainable and I've been very much a part of that where um, six years ago I burnt out I burnt out from trying to play that game thinking that that was the game that I needed to play in order to work in academia. And after 12 months of not knowing what to do, being in tears, being so exhausted that I could barely keep my eyes open, um, by putting a pretend on and going to work and pretending everything's okay, and then the moment I get into the car to drive home, I just lose it can't hold myself uh, up, I the tears, the exhaustion, that cycle, and just questioning everything. And when the alarm goes off the next morning, not jumping out of bed, excited about going to work and doing things. And so in my discovery of trying to find myself and first of all, figure out what was going on and then have beautiful friends and colleagues who I was able to bounce this expression and feeling off and process it 
at the same time is seeking professional support, I realized I was right in the middle of what I thought at the time was about to burn out, but I was burnt out. And in my uh, journey of figuring out what was going on, I found mindfulness. And I went and did the um, mindfulness-based stress reduction course, which was one of the most profound experiences of my life that has set me on the journey of um, embodying and, um, you know, with mindfulness being a core part of who I am and what I do. And it becomes a part of everything, everything from my teaching, my research, but more importantly, who I am as an individual. And it helped me also to interrupt this notion of being perfect and just um, striving to ridiculous o'clock with academia. One of the uh, joys of mindfulness was learning about formal but also informal mindful practices. And what now has become a massive part of my, um, my life is an informal mindful practice of having a green tea. And a green tea is something that I have every morning. I'm unfortunately not a coffee drinker. I love coffee, but my body, my body doesn't, doesn't uh, like coffee. And so my drink of choice has, um, has become the green tea. And as I started discovering it, I started um, a number of years ago posting on Instagram my green tea rituals and developed the hashtag of green tea uh, refills required. Since about 2017, my green teas have featured quite a bit on Instagram. And I do this as a way to document for me my practice. It's a way to slow down. It's a way to also acknowledge for me that shift from burnout to what I do, I do because I enjoy. And I've learned how to be strategic in academia to still meet my key KPIs, to still meet what the university wants. But everything I do now is really a conscious decision of um, that brings me joy. So who I play with, as in like, for example, this lovely group here with the symposium, pushes me, sparks me, brings me so much joy. And the green tea is a part of that ritual as well, because in the morning I will have the green tea, often in a cafe if I can, um, but uh, COVID taught me to be able to have it at home as well. And it's a savouring moment. It's a beautiful flavour, how it's made, how it's brewed. It's the slowing down. It's hot. So waiting for the right temperature naturally brings you to being grounded, to sit, to be in that moment, to really pause. And so every morning, I, this is my forced pause, an enjoyable pause. It allows me to be able to enjoy with others. Sometimes it's with um, in a meeting. Sometimes it's with co-writers. Sometimes it's virtually on the screen. Sometimes it's face-to-face. -face. Sometimes it's about how enjoying the green tea and thinking about my thoughts of what I want to write or what I'm reading proofreading, developing something, and it just sits there and it's just gentle and it's a beautiful pause for me that's become a lovely ritual. One of the big things is that it brings me into the present moment. It very much is my pause, my mindful act that brings an awareness. It helps me slow down. It takes the time out. I don't multitask. So I know if I'm going to enjoy my green tea with the laptop, I'm not on email, Zoom, checking something else. I'm just with one activity. I always probably have drunk half the green tea before the laptop lid comes up. 
So is there is a really conscious pause moment before I then move into that task that I wanted to do. Most often or not, my green tea accompanies my writing because I love that um, time to be creative and to write and to express myself. And that works really well for me in the morning when I'm my brain is working in a way that's nice and creative. It's a healthy habit. It's enjoyable. So I start to tick if we think about a well-being science and self-care being addressed across the multiple um, diverse areas of well-being. I start to tick a lot of different diverse areas that way, which is beautiful. When I share on Instagram, I share to document for myself to celebrate, but I also share as a way to inspire others. And just to remind us collectively that self-care can be such a small, tiny act, but it's such a powerful act when you find that small moment to support you. So I often talk about a gaggle of teapots because I have my favourite cafes and I might be there for two or three hours and, of course, there's multiple green teas in that city. Um, and sometimes in cafes I've had, um, you know, three or four teapots queued up and my gaggle of teapots, which we have a bit of a laugh about and enjoy. There's moments where I've had um, the laptop lid is closed and the notebook is out and I'm working with ideas with the pen and paper. My green tea ritual has accompanied me when I've been overseas in the bottom um, right-hand corner is a beautiful example of New York and sitting um, at breakfast there and looking out to beautiful views of um, architecture at the same time as enjoying my green tea and that ritual of preparing for a conference that was ARA in New York um, being featured there. It's also relational. So as I mentioned before, I share my green tea rituals with others. So in the top left here is Marnie and I enjoying a green tea coffee in New York at the gallery, talking through ideas, processing the art that we've seen, celebrating the conference ideas. In the middle here is my dear friend Bertha in Malaysia, in uh, uh, Sarawak, Malaysia, Borneo, enjoying a green tea ritual together and sharing her green tea ritual, cultural ritual with me that then leads into discussions about who we are in academia and what's happening. The next photo on the top right is with my colleagues in the Department of Education and we're writing papers and we have tea to share with each other. And so there's that moment where it's celebrating each other's work and ideas. Then the bottom left, is um, my friend Jonathan and we're on a writing retreat and our green tea, my green tea is there sitting and we're writing. We're in silence but we know there's that ritual celebrating those moments of Pomodoro's right for 25 minutes, chat for five minutes, right for 25 minutes, chat and the tea is a part of that beautiful ritual. And then the bottom right hand corner is uh, um, enjoying a tea in a school in Malaysia um, from a study tour and enjoying with the principal and fellow pre-service teachers um, and teachers within the school community there and enjoying a tea, celebrating what it means to be a teacher, cultural differences and talking through. In all of those acts, tea has been a ritual that helps to pause, to be present, to... Um, to bounce off ideas, to be yourself and to embrace a self-care ritual that supports and brings so much. So as I ponder these questions for myself, I also pose these questions to you. What is your self-care ritual? What is something really small that you repeat multiple times that brings so much joy to you, helps you be present, helps you slow down? And it's, it's kind of a bit of a pushback to a sector that wants us to be perfect, wants us to continually strive, wants us to just work, 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 work and ignore those pauses. What's your green tea equivalent of taking a pause and coming truly back to you? 
What does it mean to you? And what does it bring to you or offer you and offer others as well? Thank you. So in this part of the symposium, we're going to open up to um, Joanna as our discussant. So thank you, Joanna. Wow, that is just such a rich, well, like my head's popping. There are so many things to think about and congratulations on such a wonderful symposium. And I just feel like, um, getting as many people as possible to listen to the recording um, and watch it because there is just there's so much rich, richness and passion across all of the papers. Um, you know, at this time, I just, there was so much that resonated with me, but just the, um, you know, the theme that came through across all the papers is the, the state of academia and how we are how we can be um, self, more self-caring and caring for others within that space. And it's something um, that I often think about um, when I do know that within my own faculty at the moment, there are people who are burnt out. And, you know, it's, it, it's just, you know, you wonder how long we can all keep going really. Um, but I, what, um, rather than dwelling on that, I think what the paper, the set of papers have offered is um, lots of ways of thinking about self-care within that environment and, and what, what, we can, what we can do. Um, I loved the fact of um, the drawing on various creative pursuits um, and and the personal stories across each of your papers that um, you know that told um, in great richness how you addressed the being with that intensity uh, of um, in the academy and and how and and also in everyday life. Um, I think I'll just make a few comments um, about each of the papers and then um, we can open up. I want to leave enough space for people to discuss. Uh, I So starting, um, gosh, I, I was thinking so much, it seems so long we were here. <laughs> Marnie. Um, that, uh, that visual narrative um, there were so many comments that you made that resonated with me, particularly about the individualism um, and the, the powerful images that you had throughout your presentation. I, I loved the um, arranging the stones as a ritual to connect um, yourself. And that was a strong theme across all of the papers. That was what was a mechanism to connect, to connect back. And I love the um, silo or solo or collaboration um, represented by the chairs. I just looked at that image and I thought, wow, that was such a powerful image. Yes, um, that, that will stick. I think it was very, very simple, but so, so much to it. And, you know, in just your um, way in which you talked about you know, those help us understand, you know, the, the social justice issues that have really arisen through the pandemic throughout the world and the way that you phrased that and your um, comment, you know, that behind the mask have we become numb and uh, can we find a way to our hearts and that's something that um, will stick with me. And yes, I just, I urge people to um, have a think about all of those things that you, that you said. Um, the, I'll, I'll turn now to 
Oh, there were a few more things um, from about Marnie. I had them written in different parts because um, <laughs> I was bubbling over. Um, beautiful poetry. There was so many, so much rich imagery imagery that captured the moments like the fatigued reality and um, the aesthetic care. So living poetically and aesthetically in the world. And I, I loved that. Um, I just thought that was, you know, so, so important, particularly when the arts are not always embraced. So people don't get to connect aesthetically um, and with, with themselves in their world. So uh, that was a, a wonderful reminder. Um, so thank you so much for a rich presentation. Uh, Catherine, the, I loved your presentation too. It was just, you know, it was inspirational. It was refreshing. And again, you, you talked about the impoverishment of academic life and how the heart was removed and that's couldn't, um, yeah, couldn't agree more. Um, and, um, and thank you for reminding us about Parker Palmer. I think the first time I might have um, encountered Parker Palmer was way back in San Francisco at an AERA. Um, and I think he might have presented there, but, but that whole notion of the community of congruence as a way of dealing with dissonance and um, reminding us, you know, the mind, body, spirit. Um, you challenged us. What will you choose to step off the edge? And your um, wonderful account of the creative writing workshop and the rippling out that you had from that. And I think it's, it's good to be reminded of that. I've had a stepping off the edge so I can relate to the challenge and that's because, um, going back to learning jazz, um, but in a band. So uh, there's a whole group and, and um, so I'd like to just pop, pop music into um, living creatively. Um, but certainly that um, has been a very big stepping off the edge for me with a, a very gentle tutor. Um, so, you know, we, we trust these, when we step off the edge, we trust these spaces that people will be generous in spirit and, and um, nurturing. Um, that, and, and again, your um, visual narrative of wholeness with the stones, which also um, was there with Marnie. Yeah, so um, thank you. Thank you again. Um, lots, lots and lots to think about from, from your presentation. Um, Catherine, um, yours was, you know, really, oh, sorry, Marnie, I'm a Marnie, so beg your pardon. Marnie, I, um, no, I'm up to, sorry, Michelle, I'm totally getting confused here. Michelle, um, I, I loved your um, personal account uh, of, of how, you know, you, you've lived your self-care um, through your, your motherhood and being close to your children and, and, and encapsulated again that how that connection and the way that you've constructed your mindful moment, your pause, I love that term of a pause, um, and, and reconnection and how, how, powerful, how powerful that has been for you. Um, and the lovely, you know, description um, of, you know, life during the pandemic, um, which we, have not had to kind of have here the, the number of lockdowns and, and the sort of struggles. And I want to acknowledge, you know, that um, it's we have been very fortunate um, in our part of the world. So it's, um, I just, 
I can't imagine, you know, the the way in which people have had to draw on um, the their inner inner strengths and find a way through it. Um, I loved um, all of the um, your wonderful images with your children. Um, they were thank you for sharing them, and and thank you for also just re- explaining how they were there during your um, academic life, um, and and giving us glimpses too into the academic gig work that you're doing and um yeah just i think that would be um super challenging so so thank you so much um now i'll turn to narelle um wonderful images i love those um the ritual of the um the of the green tea and just how you've um, curated those on Instagram over the years. What a wonderful history. Wow. I was thinking, gosh, I wish I'd, you know, had you know, just that insight to to um, make that decision to for uh, to record in that way your green tea moment journey. Um, and yeah, it's a very, very powerful and a wonderful demonstration of the pause, you know, finding a way to pause, which again, you know, ran across all of the um, presentations and having um, and money, I think you said having moments and simple things, which again was Narelle, having the moment and simple things. And uh, that, you know, the mindfulness um formal more formal course um, and how that has been a cornerstone of your life but reminding us the, of the informal practices because I think that's often what people kind of feel oh well I can't do that how am I possibly going to do it but just reminding us that it can be those small small things and your comment that you've learned how to be strategic but remain true to yourself. And that particularly resonated because my father always used to say, to thine own self be true, from Hamlet. And um, I I often say that, think that to myself and might say that to others. But I think, um, yeah, well, it's it's good for us all that. And I guess that's at the heart of the dissonance with the academy that um, we're all feeling that we're not being true to ourselves, not being true to the way that we want to be. Um, And, yeah, so maybe we should pause. (laughs) And um, I think I I love the questions at the end, and then we'll open it up for discussion, um, that what is your self-care ritual? What does it mean to you and what does it bring, offer to you? And um, I omitted to say congratulations on the book series. Wow, those covers. So that's fantastic, Narelle. So if I'll close my remarks and and hopefully um, there'll be lots of discussion now and we've still got time. So I'm not sure um, what we do facilitate this. Yeah, let's let's just open it up because we're such a small group. If anybody wants to open up the microphone for sharing their own self-care practices or comments on each of the um, presentations or our general thoughts, very much welcome. You know, I'm probably saying something obvious to everyone who will understand this, but 
you know, so many of the practices and the points that you all spoke about, about being mindful in um, important moments, simple moments, just being mindful. Um, we, you know, and, and we see in the chat that so many people said that they too have participated in mindfulness-based training and, and different things and mindfulness-based practices and it's changed their life. You could see this in the chat from this discussion. And um, we know that we have like social emotional learning kind of missing from schooling as the primary agenda. It's not the primary agenda, it's recognized as being important for so many reasons. And, you know, everything that you talked about is um, so crucial not to instill in, you know, and we've talked about it before in an hour of the day or in a portion of the week's programming that this should be the essential part of who we are, you know, that it's okay to miss a test because it's your grandfather's birthday, like that you didn't have a chance to celebrate because your whole family was getting together. These are the kinds of things that you guys we're, you know, saying are important that we need to put first before our curricular agenda. And our curricular agenda, if we are going to impose an agenda, um, can emerge from just being human and being present and having that cup of green tea and being present with our newborn children for a while and blocking out the world and that's okay so you guys just as, as narelle said earlier like chill bumps from all of you so beautiful and i wish that there was a way that we could kind of change the system and um just go with this flow of the child doing all these kinds of things you know staring off into space or just being present you know with a toy or a song or a drink each other really great really special something that really hit me was um the use of um arts practices to be able to explore uh, our own well-being in self-care, but also as a way of um, documenting or presenting or inviting commentary as well. And I think that's an uh, aspect that comes through naturally from the book series, having visual narratives a part of it. But what's blown my mind is that um, Marnie, Catherine, Michelle today have really demonstrated how it it's such an embodied practice and it's extended out even even further in terms of the depth and the 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 beautiful sharing of the reality of what it is that we process individually and collectively when we start to position our self-care and well-being um, as an important part to ourselves personally and professionally and that they're they're molded together so it's important to our us as as individuals and collective rather than it's something we need to do because academia is broken <clears throat> or it's stressful um, or we're burnt out or there's a problem and I'm upset I need to do something to pro process it that it becomes a truly embodied body practice I wonder if um, anyone would like to sort of comment further about that and particularly presenting or the place of I'm going to call it arts practice as very broad in rabbit ears terms, but for you, what that what that is? Um, oh gosh, um, I guess I've been shifting more and more into sort of looking at art, you know, uh, artography as an artist, teacher, researcher, positioning myself in that role, and also, um, you know, Sandra Faulkner's work with poetic inquiry has really informed and really affected um, what I do. And I guess because I've been working with different people in the arts and ephrastic work over time and some of the holistic work over the years that I've done, I've really shifted into 
um, the the edges of the you know the edges stepped off the edge with it because it's still um, even though it's it is qualitative research and it is self study it's a very um, unorthodox approach I would for lack of a better term because it's my brain is gone right now um, so for me it's it's just it, for me I find it so much easier being able to to, to put something together like this than writing an academic paper, it comes naturally, it comes from somewhere deep and it's very embodied. Um, and I've been moving more and more, and you know, from our conversations more into this, this realm. And I am at a stage in my academic career where I can um, do this. I don't have to worry about tenure, I'm winding down a career. Um, so I can push the bar um, and find places to house it. And there is a wonderful Aber um, community out there and uh, arts-based education research community out there and the wonderful poetic inquiry uh, community out there that really embrace without judgment. And I think that's the big, the critical phrase is without judgment, which is why I try and locate myself in those places. If I put myself in the Foucault SIG or another SIG, I would probably get eaten alive. But, um, you know, but for the holistic SIG and the spirituality SIG, I think I think in other places that I house myself, um, I've been I've been pushed by colleagues to move in this direction, and it's starting to feel I should have been I swear I should have been a long time ago. But I think there is also an issue of the time was right for me to do this. There was a process, there was a journey, and I had to accept certain things in myself. I don't know if that was succinct enough, but anyway, I know, Catherine I with the writing was similar. <laughs> right, right. I was going to say I, I had reached a point where I just the stress was so much and I just felt so stagnated. I had to do something different. I needed something to feed my soul and poetry, writing and creativity was was that path to it combined with the mindfulness. I'm, I have I have, especially over the last four years in the United States, uh, really returned to my meditation that I had let slide because who has time to meditate, right? And then um, started meditating again and have a morning ritual of getting up and reading, um, meditating, reading, and writing before I am allowed to look at a, an electronic device. So, and sometimes it's very hard not to look at my phone. So, and the creativity is just, it's just soul feeding. I, I, I think of it that way for me. Uh, there's something spiritual about it that you know, um, helps, helps. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so Marty, you and I need to do a project together. <laughs> <laughs> get me before I retire or actually probably after I retire is a good time <laughs> exactly exactly I plan to continue I'll yes, jump off could. of both both of you in terms of creativity because now that Kieran's seven I'm because I put so much energy into the creative process with with them when they're little in creating them and and making them become autonomous individuals. Now I'm at that point where my create, like my actual inner child creativity has been like, okay, that we survived this pandemic thus far. Now I've started writing poetry and, and doing stuff that I've done since I was a kid um, because my creative energy is not solely directed at a small child anymore. They're both pretty autonomous most of the time now. So I have, I, I, I echo that creativity as mindfulness and self-care uh, line of reasoning. So thank you all so much. This has been amazing. Yeah, I would agree. It's been uh, phenomenal. Wow. Yeah. I never expected how this would come together the way it did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I see everything I hope well. for and more. It's fabulous. Thank you so much for thank you, Joanna, for your comments together. too, yeah. and Noel 